Well, good day. Uh, it's good to be with you all in spirit, if not in the flesh. I just want to make a couple announcements before we begin our worship service. First off, uh, we won't have Sunday services again next week, and we are anxiously awaiting the time we'll be able, when we'll be back together as a church family. Secondly, if you would like to uh, make contributions to the church, you can drop those off in the mailbox. The mailbox out there, it's always locked, so nobody can get to them. If you just want to slip it in there, that'll be fine in an envelope. Otherwise, you could mail it to the church. We're at 361st Street, Franklin, North Carolina, 28734. As we begin our time to worship this morning, our call to worship comes from Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, this is one of Paul's prison epistles. Uh, you may feel like you're in prison today of a sort. Uh, thankfully, we're not actually in prison, but we can feel some restrictions. Uh, but Paul is writing from prison today and asking something for the church at Colossae, and, and that is our prayer. We're asking the Lord for these wonderful blessings to come to us as we worship him in spirit and in truth today. The Apostle Paul writes as follows, May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together." We, too, are being held together by Christ today. He is the Lord of all things. He has brought us into his kingdom, and we are looking to him today to bless us with his spirit, his presence, and his word. Let's go to him in prayer. Almighty God, we come before you this morning as our Father, through Jesus Christ, your Son, and our Lord. We enter the most holy place, your very presence clothed with the righteousness of Christ and filled by the Holy Spirit. We are filled with gratitude to you this morning for you have not given up on us. Indeed, the very opposite is the case. You remain with us, you abide in us, you strengthen us with all power, as Paul wrote, for endurance and patience with joy. Oh, how we need you to fill us with such good gifts today, with endurance with patience and with joy we thank you lord that you are willing and able to do all this and ever so much more we thank you for the privilege of drawing near to you of knowing that you draw near to us and so bless us we pray with a sense of your presence even though we are apart this day by the holy spirit we are one in the body of christ so unite our hearts around your throne that we may experience the righteousness, peace, and joy of Christ and his kingdom. And so, having relished these, may we go forth to spread the joy of this kingdom, this kingdom of light, of life, and of love. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name, and it's now to our King and for his kingdom that we pray. Together, although separate, we pray the prayer that our Lord Jesus himself taught us to pray, saying now together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. We give thanks to the Lord for adopting us into his family, for bringing us into his kingdom. And it is a kingdom that is founded on truth. We have been listening to news reports all week on the television, on the radio, through the internet. We've heard lots of things, but we come this day to the God who 
is the truth to Jesus Christ, his son, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And this kingdom is founded on the truth. And we delight to confess the truths of this kingdom. We confess our faith this morning with the Apostles' Creed. We trust that uh, if you are willing to confess this with us, it's what you believe too. And so we take joy in confessing our faith to the Father and in the presence of one another. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen and amen. Let's take a moment now to confess our sin. Uh, this morning as we continue journeying through the Heidelberg Catechism, we come to another part of the 40th Lord's Day reading. They're divided up into 52 Lord's Days, uh, 52 weeks in the year, uh, one for each uh, week, but we're not, we're moving a little bit more deliberately through the Heidelberg Catechism. Today we come to the second part of the Lord's Day number 40, uh, questions 106 and 107. Uh, and these two have to deal with the sixth commandment as we confessed it, uh, together last week. Uh, the sixth commandment has, is very simply uh, no murder. Uh, and last week we talked about what that means and the two questions this week uh, kind of riff off that. They are expounding that in a little greater detail. Uh, the question and answer I'll read. If you'd please ponder these in your hearts as you listen. The sixth commandment, does this commandment refer only to murder? The answer, by forbidding murder, God teaches us that he hates the root of murder, envy, hatred, anger, and vindictiveness. In God's sight, all such are disguised forms of murder. And question number 107, is it enough then that we do not murder our neighbor in any such way? The answer, no. By condemning envy, hatred, and anger, God wants us to love our neighbors as ourselves, to be patient, peace-loving, gentle, merciful, and friendly toward them, to protect them from harm as much as we can, and to do good even to our enemies. We have been reminded probably on numerous occasions this week that this is a very important thing right now in our own day uh, with all the uh, stress that people are under with the current virus that's going around, COVID-19. Uh, we are reminded of ways in which uh, a lot of people are not being very neighborly in this particular time. They are not being patient. They're not peace-loving. They are clamoring. They are hoarding. They are doing all sorts of things to, uh, to accumulate uh, comfort or supplies or other things for themselves. But here, God is reminding us, and certainly Jesus reminds us in the Sermon on the Mount, that we are to be patient and peace-loving, even to the point of doing good and loving our enemies. Uh, this is a very important thing in our own particular day and time, and one in which the church and the gospel shines forth as we seek to be a light to the nations. And so let's gather our hearts together now, confessing our sin and asking God to pardon us and to help us to do what we've just talked about, to be friendly toward our neighbors, to protect them from harm as much as we can, and to do good even to our enemies. So let's pray and ask God's forgiveness together, and then we'll hear the good news of the pardon of Christ upon us. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we are reminded 
here in this sixth commandment once again that you are the one who alone has completely and utterly lived these out. You have performed them perfectly without flaw or fault. And so we thank you, Lord, that not only uh, did you not harbor hatred or envy or anger in your heart, but also, Lord, you loved your enemies. You loved us. While we were yet enemies, Christ died for us. While we were strangers and aliens to you, you loved us. And you not only loved us from afar, but you loved us by coming near, by giving yourself up as a ransom for us to forgive us of all of our sin, to give your life freely as a sacrifice and as a substitute for us. Oh, what great love you have for us. Scarcely will one die for a righteous man, but God shows his own love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So we thank you, Lord, for loving us, for showing kindness even to your enemies, as we'll see in a few moments, even to Judas on the night in which he betrayed you, you were yet loving toward him. And so, Lord, if you've set this as our standard, we recognize that we fall so far short of what we ought to do and what your Spirit is enabling us to do. But yet, Lord, day by day, we turn our backs to love and we forget the manner in which we have been loved. And so, Lord, we thank you once again for your grace to us. Thank you once again for forgiving us and for enabling us to love our neighbors. Lord, we need you. We need your help. We need your strength. We need your endurance and your patience. And we need your joy to fill us so that we would go forth and truly love our neighbors well today and this week. And so we do ask you to forgive us of our sins once again for Christ's sake, knowing that upon him our iniquities were laid. And he, by his wounds, has healed us. And so, Jesus, we thank you. Holy Spirit, would you fill us to walk now in this love, in the love of Christ for your glory and for the joy of the nations. We ask all this in Jesus' name, for his sake. Amen. Amen. The assurance of pardon is here in Colossians chapter 1. Speaking of the work of God the Father and God the Son, Paul wrote, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Thanks be to God indeed for this gift of grace. We now also uh, want to continue in a spirit of prayer, a spirit of supplication as we remember the needs that are around us. Uh, we continue to uh, be reminded of the burdens, not only locally, but in our state, nationally, and internationally. Uh, all eyes are on the same thing right now, uh, and that's this current virus, um, as well as the other needs that are before us, different nations handling things different ways. Uh, we recognize that over all these nations, our God reigns, and we can give him thanks and ask him to intervene. The way that he does that is in his own power, with his own infinite power and glory and goodness and strength and wisdom. And we pray that he would shower the nations with that very thing, that people would be coming to know Christ most of all, but also so that people would be blessed, that they would have the time necessary to respond to the good news of the gospel. And so as we pray for the various needs that are around us, we want to remember that God is showing us mercy. He does so every day. Indeed, his mercies are new every morning. And as he does so, 
He is extending the time so that we have the opportunity to love our neighbors, to extend the grace of Christ, and to be a blessing to others as he calls us to be and do. So as we pray for others today, uh, we certainly want to pray for our medical leaders, uh, for doctors and nurses, uh, those who are on the front lines. This is a very, very difficult, stressful time for them. Uh, praying that uh, also supply chains would would come back online so that they especially would have everything that they need, whether it's respiration equipment, whether it's uh, gowns and headwear and face masks and eye protection, all those sorts of things. Uh, we also want to pray for specialists, uh, those who are uh, working behind the scenes, running tests, and we want to pray for them. Uh, also, national and international organizations that are working to try to find some treatment, some vaccine for, for this. So we want to pray for medical leaders. We also want to pray for community leaders, for our county, for our town, for uh, the health department. We want to pray for state and national leaders. We also want to pray for teachers and educational leaders uh, right now. We want to lift them up as they are uh, also in need. They are on a different sort of front lines as we've uh, been watching the school buses go around this past week. We see them delivering meals, um, uh, many thousands of meals delivered just this week already. So we want to lift them up and ask the Lord to provide for them too. Uh, there are lots of things in our hearts right now, and we want to take our hearts to the Lord and ask him to, to bless us, to guard us, to guide us, and to be with us. So let's go to him now in prayer. Almighty God, we do thank you for being the great and awesome God, the one who knows the end from the beginning. There is indeed nothing hidden from you. You are God and there is no other. You are the great and sovereign Lord of all creation. There is not one atom in the entire universe that's hidden from you. That's things that are seen, but neither are our thoughts, our emotions, our hopes, our cares, our concerns. These are not hidden from you either. You see everything, whether we can see it or whether it belongs to that unseen realm, all things are alike plain to you. There is nothing hidden from you. You are the Lord of all, the Lord of molecules and viruses and bacteria. You are the master of every cell. You are the Lord of systems, whether it's the solar system or whether it's our respiratory system, whether it's governmental systems, you are the Lord of all these. And we come to you not only worshiping you today, but asking you to intervene with power and wisdom and love and grace so that people would be inclined to seek you and to worship you while you may be found. And Lord, we thank you for all those who are laboring so tirelessly. Uh, we have friends and family who are working on those front lines, uh, whether those are local hospitals or uh, hospitals far away, nurses and doctors and technicians and specialists. We want to lift them up to you, Lord, as they are struggling right now, as they deal with fatigue, uh, with exhaustion, uh, with perhaps other issues as well, whether psychological or emotional or physical. Lord, we lift them up to you. And we ask, Lord, that you would be gracious and merciful to them and strengthen them, especially those who are called by your name, especially those who trust in the Lord Jesus. Lord, would you help them especially to be a light in dark places today? Would you let your light shine through them? We thank you that it is, and we pray that it would continue and even increase in the days to come. We also want to lift up to you uh, supply chains. Uh, we pray for those in the manufacturing facilities, not only here in America, but around the world, those who are seeking to increase production levels, 
to supply the needs that are around us, whether that is a, a paper production company up in Canton uh, here in North Carolina or whether it's a, a medical supplies company far away. Lord, we ask that you would help them and give them wisdom about how much is enough and, and how much is too much and, and what exactly they should do. So grant them wisdom too, we pray, uh, for the truck drivers and for the uh, train engineers and for uh, those who are uh, piloting the, the ships across the ocean, for those who are flying planes, the pilots, and, and everyone else involved, Lord. Uh, we recognize our, our solidarity in this as we face a common foe. And yet, Lord, we also want to lift up to you um, not just the economic side of things, not just the medical side of things, but also the political side of things. Um, we live in a difficult time. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for uh, the ways in which there is an increased spirit of cooperation uh, Lord, we want to see that increase even more. Um, we've seen so much anger and vitriol over the past years with uh, animosity uh, reigning in uh, state government, national government. And so, Lord, we pray that in this time we would find that solidarity that brings us together and that you would be at work in this. We also want to pray for those uh, so often unsung heroes our teachers, our principals and administrators, uh, those who are working right now behind the scenes, uh, trying to keep up relationships with students and to provide them instructional materials. Uh, they're also riding buses, delivering meals and making connections, Lord. So we lift them up to you too. We thank you for all these folks um, and uh, the ones who are the true heroes. Uh, those who really do make a, an incalculable difference in our lives, but so often we forget to thank them. Uh, and so we thank you for them today and help us to show them our thanks today. We thank you, Lord, for your grace to us, for your power to help us, your ability to, uh, to make us even to thrive in this time, spiritually speaking. So help us, we pray to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And we ask all this in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen. Well, let's open our Bibles. Uh, we're going to return to Mark's gospel today. Mark chapter 14. And in Mark chapter 14, we're reminded that this is on the night before uh, Jesus would be arrested. Uh, the night before his uh, trial, his crucifixion, and his death. And this setting is one that is uh, very private, very intimate. We find here Jesus celebrating the Passover with his disciples. This would have been a Jewish uh, feast that had been celebrated uh, since 1400 or so BC. So it's a long, long tradition and one in which uh, it carries a lot of meaning, a lot of weight, uh, not just because this was a meal, the final meal that they would share, but it also carries a lot of weight because of what it symbolizes to God's people throughout all ages. And Jesus here is speaking to his disciples. He's mindful of what's getting ready to happen with Judas' betrayal. He's mindful of the sorrow that awaits him and the difficulty that is um, coming. Nevertheless, while he speaks and while he teaches, he's also teaching us as well. And so as we consider God's word, uh, let us attend to it by the power of the Spirit. Uh, let us listen to what God the Lord is speaking to us today. We're going to read first from Mark chapter 14. And we're going to read verses 12 through 25. Mark 14, 12 through 25. And then we're going to read 11 verses from John chapter 6. That's the end of John chapter 6. We're going to begin in verse 61, which also speaks about Judas' betrayal, but it also speaks about the disciples and their faithfulness. So let's now read this portion of God's word 
We're going to read first from Mark chapter 14 and then turn over to John chapter 6. If you're able, would you please stand for the reading of God's word wherever you are. And on the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him and wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, where is my guest room? where I may eat the Passover with my disciples. And he will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. There, prepare for us. And the disciples set out and went to the city and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. And when it was evening, he came with the twelve. And as they were reclining at table and eating, Jesus said, Truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be sorrowful and to say to him one after another, Is it I? He said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the dish with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. And as they were eating, he took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And now from John chapter 6, we'll be beginning in verse 61. Jesus has just fed the 5,000 and he is... On the next day, the people are disputing with him, especially uh, the religious leaders, uh, the Jews here, as John calls them, for instance, in verse 41. Uh, and then again in verse 52, the Jews disputed among themselves. They're disputing with Jesus about the way in which Jesus tells them that he is the bread of life. This is some very difficult teaching. Because he said, my flesh is bread and my blood, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. Jesus is not here commending cannibalism, of course. He's not doing any such thing. What he is doing is telling them that just as you eat bread and drink water to live physically, so you must eat his flesh and drink his blood to live spiritually. He's speaking about the Passover in particular. John chapter 6 and verse 61, the disciples being challenged by this teaching, they are wondering what they are to do, and Jesus is wondering if they're going to leave him. John 6 verse 61, but Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to the Father, can come to me unless it is granted to him by the Father. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go away as well? 
Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve? And yet, one of you is a devil. He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. This is God's word for God's people. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Would you please pray with me? Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires are known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may more perfectly love you and more worthily magnify your holy name. These prayers we ask in the name of Jesus, trusting in him. Amen. Amen. Wherever you are, please be seated as we attend to God's word today. Those of you who are of my generation and perhaps a generation back may and probably do remember the TV series, The Incredible Hulk, starring Bill Bixby and Lou Ferrigno. Uh, maybe you watched the series, and if you did, you'll remember that classic line from Bill Bixby, whenever someone began doing something you didn't like, doing something to him or doing something to someone else. And he always said the same thing, it seems. And that thing that he said was this, don't make me angry. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry. And then if they kept on doing that thing, he would turn into, you know, he would hulk out and that would be his warning to other people. And the warning communicated that when he became the Hulk, he wouldn't be responsible for what happened and would lead to his wandering down the road to some other location and adopting another uh, alias. He couldn't be responsible. He would be out of control, not quite rational at least, and no one would be safe, not the people that he really liked or the people that he really didn't like. Well. For those of you who've kind of tracked this over the years, in the 2012 movie, The Avengers, there was a memorable scene involving Bruce Banner before he turns into the Hulk at the beginning of the battle in New York. Someone asks him to turn into the Hulk. I think it was Captain America. Uh, But they're wondering if he can just get angry all of a sudden and turn into the Hulk. He replies, that's my secret. I'm always angry. And he turns around, he hulks out, and he you know, lets, lets loose. Constantly angry. And therefore, he determines when to lose control. When should he lose control? His normal state of being is being angry. I can't imagine what that would be like. He determines when to lose control, when to let loose. And when Banner loses control and becomes the Hulk is when the enemies are routed, problems are solved, and he's able to get back to just living his life. Now, this notion of being in control is interesting to me. It's interesting because I know that I'm not in control of very much. But we wonder, well, what if I were in control? What if I could take control all of a sudden, much like the Hulk takes control of the situation by losing control and by hulking out. When I was younger and maybe not that much younger than I am now, what if I were really strong? What if I were really, really incredibly strong? Then I would be in control. Well, you can fill in the blank for yourself. What if I were really blank, then I would be in control. What if I were really smart? Maybe then I would be in control. Maybe if I were so aware of other people, I would then be in control. Maybe if I were uh, rich, then I would be in control. Maybe if something else, then I would be 
in control. We have this sense that we maybe we ought to be in control, but we're not. And that certainly comes home to us in times like these. We recognize that we're out of control. There's a virus floating around. Where did it come from? Where can it go? It's floating in the air. It's in our aerosols, the things that um, come when we cough or we sneeze, or maybe if we just uh, breathe out very forcefully, uh, maybe we let the virus loose on someone else. We feel like we're not in control. And what would give us control? Is it money? Is it strength? Is it smarts? Is it social power? Is it solidarity? Is it something else that would grant us the control that we crave? Control can certainly be an idol of our hearts, teasing us to think that we can somehow get our handle on ourselves or a handle on our situation if we only try harder. And maybe even we think we can get a handle on our sin if we will work hard enough at it. But in our passage today, here in Mark chapter 14, we find not that the disciples are in control, not that Judas is in control, but that Jesus is in control. Though he has reason to be thoroughly angry, he's not going to hulk out. He could. He has complete ability to dispose of all of his enemies with, he probably wouldn't even have to use a word, but he could rout them quickly and easily. But he chooses not to do that. Why? He's controlling himself because he has a greater purpose. He has a greater goal. Jesus has reason to be thoroughly angry, thoroughly disappointed, perhaps even despondent over the situation, but In spite of these, Jesus chooses differently, and he does so because he is in control. Now, I see three ways in this passage that Jesus' control is manifested. First, consider how he made special preparations to share this special meal with his disciples. It took forethought that he would arrange, I believe that's the best explanation for this event here in verses 12 through 16, where Jesus tells the disciples to go into the city, find a man carrying a jar of water, find something very unusual. You'll be able to spot him because no man carries a jar of water. But if you find a man carrying a jar of water, he's the one you need to go to. Go to him, follow him to where he goes, tell the master of the house, etc., etc. So Jesus is in control. He's already made these arrangements beforehand so that he can share this meal with his disciples. It took Jesus' control to plan everything out the way that it was. Consider, secondly, how Jesus knew the identity of his betrayer, but chose to withhold it. He didn't tell anybody else. Jesus' lips were sealed on this matter. And John tells us that he knew from the beginning who would betray him. So this isn't a recent revelation for almost three years now. Jesus has known that Judas would be the one. And yet how they've shared meals together, how they've walked and talked together, how they've done life together. And yet now Judas is approaching that time where he will betray our Lord. Now he could have said, Judas is the one who will betray me. But he doesn't do that. In verse 18, truly I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. And then again in verse 20, it is one of the 12, one who is dipping bread into the dish with me. And so Jesus, even here, does not disclose who this betrayer would be. He used it as an opportunity to prompt his disciples to self-examination. And that's exactly what you see them doing in verse 19. They, the disciples, began to be sorrowful and to say to him one after another, Is it I? They all wonder, well, am I going to do it? They are not in control of themselves even. They don't know whether they are going to be the one to betray. Jesus knows something about them that they don't know themselves. And so they're questioning. They are examining themselves. Is it I? 
Is it I who will betray our Lord? That's the second way that Jesus showed his control of the situation. The preparations for the meal, the identity of betrayer, his betrayer, and now thirdly, how Jesus' control is seen in extending grace even to Judas. As we see in John chapter 6, Jesus was fully aware of the situation, not only full aware, fully aware, but fully in control. He doesn't tell Judas to leave, even though he knows that Judas doesn't believe, even though he knows what Judas is going to do, and even though he knows that Judas is a devil, John chapter 6 and verse 70. He knows all these things about Judas and yet continues extending grace. They share a meal together. They're dipping bread into the bowl together. They are even eating this Lord's Supper, this last Passover together. So this care over the meal, the prompting to examination, the extension of grace to Judas, from these three considerations, we learn about Jesus' control of the situation. His control matters, and it shows us such a beautiful picture of our Savior. Jesus could have pulled a sort of incredible Hulk moment. He could have let loose his anger on the disciples and especially on Judas. He could have done any number of other things. But he restrained himself. He was in control. And that control enabled him not to panic, not to let loose his righteous anger, but to show his love. Not to let the words fly, nor to let anything loose, but to demonstrate his love, Jesus maintained control. We'll continue seeing this throughout the crucifixion account. Jesus said his last words, into your hands I commit my spirit. Those are words of control. Jesus uttered on the cross. And so Jesus is displaying his love for his disciples, even as he's in complete control of the situation. And all these would witness his love, even Judas. So then what does separate Judas from the rest? Why Judas? What is the difference between Judas and the other 11 disciples? Two things distinguish Judas from the rest. First, the father's choice. Judas' betrayal had been prophesied in the Old Testament. As Jesus said here in verse 21, for the Son of Man goes as it is written of him. Jesus knew his scriptures. Jesus knew the Old Testament. He knew what had been written about him, and he knew that someone would betray him. Now, where is this specifically prophesied? Psalm chapter 55. Verses 13 and 14. We also find this reflected in the rest of the New Testament. In Acts chapter 2, Jesus was delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. So we see that separating Judas from the other 11, that the Father knew that Judas would betray him. It had been written in the Old Testament. It is repeated in the New Testament. The second thing that separates Judas from the rest of the disciples was the lack of faith. Judas didn't believe, John 6, verse 64. Even though Judas was not one of the twelve, Jesus still offered him the bread and the cup. He extended grace to the man who would betray him with a kiss. And he extends grace to you and to me today as well. Though none of us are Judas, Judas had a particular role at a particular moment in redemptive history. You, unlike Judas, are not going to sell Christ out. You are not going to betray him in the same way that Judas did. But who Judas was and what Judas did is the fruit of unbelief. Judas was an unbeliever and that led to his actions. Unbelief was expressed in 
his words and actions. Likewise, if we are unbelieving, it will be expressed in our words and actions. What's in the heart comes out through the mouth, through the hands, in the thoughts, but also in the words and in the deeds. Our hearts will be exposed. Jesus put it this way, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. If you're repentant in your heart, then you bear fruit through your words and through your actions. Repentance is the change of mind, change of heart, change of attitude towards sin. It's a turning away from sin and towards Christ. And if your heart has changed, then your words and actions will too. Are you unbelieving? What is it that you believe about Jesus? And does that belief match your words and your actions? And this is what Paul means when he urges the Corinthians to examine themselves as they prepared to receive the Lord's Supper. Examine yourselves. Well, how do we examine ourselves? Well, are we believing or unbelieving? We are looking for the presence of faith, believing in Christ, trusting in him. Well, answer these questions. How shall you make it to heaven? What are the terms of admission? How shall your sins, though black as coal, be washed clean? It is only through the blood of Christ. But why is this faith so important? Why was it so important? Well, the presence of faith or lack of faith makes the difference between a disciple and a Judas. For Judas, he was de destined to, by God to betray Jesus. And his lack of faith resulted in his eternal damnation. Jesus says in verse 21, Woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. That's something we never want to hear from Jesus. Woe is me. Woe coming from Jesus to us would certainly undo us. Judas was responsible for what he did, for how he responded to Jesus, and that response showed a lack of faith. For the other 11, they were destined by God for faith, and their faith was seen in their believing. No matter how stumbling, no matter how faltering, they did believe. They all stumbled, but they did not fall. Judas fell, but the 11 did not. Now, why is that? Because of God's choice, God's will, God's spirit. Because of a response like the father of the possessed boy back in chapter 9. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. They respond because of God's choosing them. And we could put it like this. God's choice of them is seen in their choice to believe. God chose them, and they chose to believe. The one necessarily comes before the other. God's work in a sinner's heart produces faith and repentance and all the rest. It's because of what we read in John chapter 6. No one can come to me unless it is granted to him by the Father. That's verse 65. It was this gift of faith seen in believing that separated the 11 from Judas. And it's always been the same. Now in this passage, we find Jesus celebrating the Passover with his disciples. In the original Passover, you can read about it in Exodus chapter 12. What separated Israel from Egypt when the angel of death passed over? What separated Israel from Egypt from this death of the firstborn, the tenth and last and worst plague. It certainly was not wealth or social standing. The Egyptians were wealthy and the Hebrews were slaves. It was also not social standings. The Egyptian had social standing. The Israelites had none. It was not smarts or strengths. All of them were sinners. The Egyptians and the Israelites, they were all sinners. 
So it wasn't that one was righteous and one was unrighteous. They're all sinners. They all deserve death. Every single one of them, not just the firstborn, but all of them together deserved death. What separated them then? Why did some lose their firstborn, but others did not? It was the blood applied. Faith in action. What they believed came out in their hands and through their mouths as well. What was the response? Well, Moses said to them, God says, okay, put the blood on the doorposts and on the lintel of your house. And when the angel sees it, he will pass over you. Well, if he does that, if the Israelite does that, then the angel of death will pass over. It wasn't that he was righteous. It was that the blood had been applied. That was the only thing that separated the Israelites from the Egyptians. They had to believe that death and judgment were coming. They had to believe that the only way to be spared was to apply the blood to their house. And those who applied the blood were safe. And this, of course, points us straight to Jesus. How can you and I be safe? How can we be eternally safe? Though in the world we have tribulation, how can we be safe for eternity? It is only through the blood applied to our hearts. It is not through strength or smarts or wealth or social standing that anyone can or might be saved. It is only through the blood applied to your heart. Faith. Now, let's put some things together here. The disciples had been told by Jesus that he would suffer, die, and rise again. The disciples had been told that the way of Jesus, that narrow road, would be one of service, sacrifice, and even suffering for his name's sake. The disciples faced an uncertain future, but they could rest in Jesus. Now, why is that? Because his blood was applied to them. They were participants in this new covenant meal by faith, eating and drinking Christ's body and blood. Judas ate too, but his eating was not by faith. And it resulted in his condemnation. They were eating and drinking Christ's body and blood, and his life was becoming theirs, and his life was sustaining theirs. We too, like these disciples, live with uncertainty exacerbated by this current virus, COVID-19, and the turmoil that it's creating. But this, like all other things, is under our Father's control. Just like the oil crisis back in the 70s, just like 9-11, just like the market crash and the housing crash of 2008, and the political climate and the climate crisis, all these are under our Father's hand. And all of these events though very different, resulting in different things, ought to cause us a similar reaction. Though many purposes, these events should especially sober us Christians up, remind us where our true hope lies, and point out what has been falsely propping up our hope. C.S. Lewis was a soldier in World War I. He came home. God mercifully transformed his heart sometime later and drew him to himself. And most of the works that we have of his uh, stem from his Christian faith. One of the works that he wrote was is called the Screwtape Letters. And in this, you have a um, sort of senior under demon uh, named Wormwood. Uh, Well, Screwtape is the, is kind of senior guy. And then Wormwood is the, his underling, his trainee. And so it's written from an evil perspective, so to speak. And so Screwtape is a demon. He refers to God as the enemy. He often discusses the plans of the enemy because those are God's plans. He discusses the motives of the enemy, the enemy's motives. What are the enemy's motives? They don't quite know, but 
He's referring to God as his enemy because Satan and God are enemies. Um, and so he's writing these letters to his, uh, to his trainee. And in one of the letters, letter number 29, uh, Screwtape the demon writes as follows. This indeed is probably one of the enemy's motives for creating a dangerous world, a world in which moral issues really come to the point. He sees, as well as you do, that courage is not simply one of the virtues, but the form of every virtue at the testing point. A chastity or honesty or mercy which yields to danger will be chaste or honest or merciful only on conditions. Pilate was merciful till it became risky. I think that this is insightful, not only for Lewis's day as he's writing during World War II, but, but also for us. We and everyone else live in a dangerous world. Our existence has always been, as one author put it, precarious. We've always been on the edge, whether it was measles or smallpox or the plague or war or something else. Existence is always on the edge. We live in a dangerous world, but it's not a random world. We live in a world which is under God's control. And this world, under God's controls, puts our morals to the test, Lewis is saying. Jesus' trial could have been Pilate's finest hour, but his courage failed. Likewise, the current moment could be the church's finest hour, maybe even Grace Church's finest hour. And let us pray to God for the courage and wisdom so that it may be. So as we consider what is being spoken here, Jesus being in control of the situation, he's still in control of our situation, even here, even today, even now, even internationally, he's in complete control. This has not changed. It is still the case, just as we read in our call to worship from Colossians chapter one, he holds all things together. This doesn't take him by surprise, and it certainly doesn't take him off guard. Jesus isn't reeling from the blow of this. His throne is secure, and his control has been established. And so as we rest in that, this is a time for believers, for us, for you, for me, to shine with the light of Christ because people need hope. They need a sense of Safety, a sense of security, which is not to be found in this world. It cannot be found in this world. It's to be found in Christ alone. Our hymn of response is the solid rock. Uh, you may be familiar with the words of this hymn. It's a wonderful hymn. One stanza, uh, it reads differently in different hymnals. It may read this way in the hymnal that uh, that you may look at, whether online or whether it's your own personal copy. It reads this, When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. Another way, another rendering of this stanza is this, When every earthly prop gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. When every earthly prop. So we need to ask ourselves, well, what's been propping me up? Is it economic health? Is it physical health? Is it political health? Is it having the right guy in office? Is it some other earthly prop that's been propping us up? And maybe this is a time where Jesus is just gently, maybe not so gently, kicking out those props from under, underneath us so that we'll recognize that we're not leaning on him the way that we should. We're leaning on something else, whether it's money or strength or health or power or prestige or whatever it is. We must lean upon Jesus. So what earthly props has God been revealing to you? What is propping up your sense of well-being during this time? 
we come to Jesus. As the disciples said to him back there in John chapter 6, Lord, to whom else shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed. And so let us keep on believing. The benediction this morning is from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And I offer it to you. Uh, may you know the joy and peace of our Savior. I offer this benediction to you now from his word and his name. Now may our Lord Jesus himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort, and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. To God be the glory and all God's people said, Amen.